or you have any questions about your blood sugar, maybe you're seeing some high levels and low levels and not sure what's going on with your symptoms and or how to test for reactive hypoglycemia. My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to look at some of the different ways to test for reactive hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia, some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different testing methodologies. As I said, my name is Dr. Sarah Nellen. If you're new to this channel, I just want you to know that I make these videos to help you go beyond the basics of your health, whether it's a confusing lab test, symptom diagnosis, et cetera. I make these videos to help you get a better understanding of what's going on with your health. So if you like this kind of information on nutrition, health, hormone, overall optimization of your health, click on the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this one. Now for a quick disclaimer, the information contained in this video is for informational purposes only. It's not intended as treatment for any medical condition or a substitute for seeing an actual doctor or medical professional. It should be used as an educational guide to deepen your understanding of your own health and treatment success. If medical attention is needed, don't delay in seeking that attention. All right, let's check out how to test for reactive hypoglycemia. In this video, we're going to look at how to test for reactive hypoglycemia. There are several ways to test for hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia, and each has its advantages and maybe disadvantages. One way, of course, is to just look at your fasting blood sugar. This is very rarely going to show up low, but in some cases it would, and then it would prompt you to maybe look a little deeper at what your blood sugar is after eating or at other times throughout the day. More commonly, people will check their blood sugar during an episode when they're feeling like they might be hypoglycemic or low blood sugar, when the symptoms are present as discussed in the previous video. And some of the times when you check it, it can actually capture the problem. Yet sometimes when you're trying to capture it, you're going to miss the window when it's actually low and therefore miss that diagnosis because it may not last that long. Most people don't have access to a home glucose monitor, but they can be sold over the counter in some states and you should be able to get one if you think this could be happening. Again, the problem is capturing the actual event. Once you start feeling those symptoms, part of those symptoms are what your body is doing to release more of the stored glucose that's in your body. So by the time you get to checking it, it may actually normalize. The next possibility for testing is the two-hour postprandial glucose test. This is a more traditional way for looking at reactive hypoglycemia. Reactive hypoglycemia occurs when the pancreas overcompensates for the high blood sugar that it sees through its detection methodologies. When it overproduces that insulin, the insulin is going to drive the blood sugar into the cells and tissues, which drops the blood sugar level. When that happens, when you get below a certain level, your body kicks in epinephrine, cortisol, and things that are generally stimulatory and can happen really abruptly and cause you to start sweating and feel all of those negative symptoms that are associated with hypoglycemia, sweating, nausea, sometimes vomiting, etc. With the onset of insulin resistance and prediabetes, there's commonly a delay in the postprandial insulin response. And because of that delay, the glucose is allowed to get a little bit higher than it would otherwise when the pancreas does kick in, there's an excess response. And this can lead to what we call reactive hypoglycemia. So there's the two-hour glucose tolerance test where you use 75 grams of a simple carbohydrate, and then you go and check your blood sugar at baseline before you eat the 75 grams of simple carbs, and then after to try to capture this spike in glucose or drastic drop in the glucose. Problem is, sometimes that narrow time frame will actually miss people that are having the problem. And this is why a continuous glucose monitor is a better way to test for this. With this, you have the ability to see your glucose every second of every day as it is continually taking samples. And anything above that 140, maybe even 160, if you want to be liberal with it, would be considered high. Anything below 70 milligrams per deciliter would be considered low. Now, typically wouldn't be considered hypoglycemia unless you have symptoms to match this. And we did discuss those in a previous video if you want to check that out. Then the question remains, what are you going to do about 
hypoglycemia and reactive hypoglycemia. When the symptoms and testing for reactive hypoglycemia match that you do or likely do have this, what is the next step? That's what we're going to look at in the next series of videos on this topic. And that topic is resolving reactive hypoglycemia. All right. So hopefully that helps you better understand how to test for reactive hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia in general. If you do have questions on this topic, drop it in the comment section. Happy to answer your question. We'll see you again next time.